Hi everybody, Dr. Mike here. In this video, we're taking a look at two really important hormones termed the gonadotropins. These are follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. And we're going to take a look to see what roles they play in both the female reproductive cycles and the male reproductive cycle. Let's take a look. So to begin, we need to understand that, as I said in the beginning, that FSH and LH cumulatively are termed the gonadotropins. So if we break that word up, gonado is the first part, the prefix, and then tropins is the suffix. So gonado tells you that these hormones are traveling to the gonads to have their function. So in the female reproductive system, this is going to be the ovaries, and in the male reproductive system, this is going to be the testes. Now the suffix, tropin, tells you that these hormones, when they get to the gonads, they're going to tell the gonads to release more hormones. That's what tropins mean. Now importantly, this is important, any hormone that doesn't have the suffix tropin is likely going to be the end stage hormone. It's not gonna release any more hormones. So that's a bit of a hint for future exams. All right, let's start with the female reproductive system and the role that FSH and LH play. Firstly, FSH and LH are named after what they do in the female reproductive system. First of which is termed follicle stimulating hormone. Second is luteinizing hormone. Now it might not sound like much yet, but it'll make total sense in a second. Unfortunately, their names tell you nothing about what they do in the male reproductive system, but the hormones are used in both male and female reproductive systems. These hormones start to get released in their highest abundance once puberty hits. And again, this is for both male and female reproductive cycles. So when puberty hits, that's when FSH and LH start to spike. Importantly, puberty is going to set in between what, eight to 13 years of age-ish, all right? So what's happening before that? Well, for the female reproductive cycle, a lot. Let's take a look. Inside the ovary or ovaries of a female, let's draw an ovary up. Let's draw a real big ovary up. It's not going to be to scale, obviously, but let's draw this ovary up. Here we go. What we need to understand is that in utero, so when a female is developing as a fetus inside of their own mother's uterus, let's say 20 weeks, right? This is halfway through gestation. So halfway through fetal development, they have a number of what we call oocytes or eggs. So I've just drawn one oocyte up here. In actual fact, at around about 20 weeks gestation, a female will have around about 7 million of these eggs. Now we call these eggs primary oocytes. Now the thing is the eggs can't just exist or survive by themselves in the ovary. They need to be nourished, they need to be fed, they need to be looked after. So what we find early on is that these oocytes will be surrounded by this layer of cells that we call pregranulosa cells. So these cells on the outside here, they're called pregranulosa cells. Pregranulosa. And cumulatively, the whole thing together with both the oocyte and the pregranulosa cells, this is called a primordial follicle. A primordial follicle. Now here's the thing, there's a process called follicular genesis, which I've done a video on, in which these follicles develop. So this primordial follicle will actually turn into something called a primary follicle, which will turn into something called a secondary follicle, which can move on and turn into various phases that might become a preantral or antral or graphian or mature follicle or preovulatory follicle. There's a whole bunch of different names for this end stage aspect of the follicle, but we'll get there in a second. Let's just draw up the primordial to the primary to the secondary. What happens from primordial to primary is that the oocyte obviously remains throughout. That's an important point. So here's our oocyte. But the pregranulosa cells that surround the primordial become what we now term granulosa cells. So let's write that up, granulosa cells, because they're very important, these granulosa cells. Granulosa. And what you start seeing appearing outside of the granulosa cells are these 
other cells sort of like not not in a nice layer, but sort of sporadically spread around, called theca cells. So we've also got theca cells here. So together we've got granulosa and theca cells with the oocyte that's called a primary follicle. As it turns from a primary to a secondary follicle, these granulosa cells get bigger, so they develop more layers. And we tend to get now distinct layers of theca cells. All right, so now we've got distinct granulosa and theca cell layers, and that's what we call a secondary follicle. Now here's an important point. Pre-puberty, right, pre-puberty, inside the ovary, so again, this is the ovary, right? Inside the ovary of a developing female fetus. So again, 20 weeks gestation, seven million of these primordial follicles exist, and they undergo this process. But here's the thing. At 20 weeks gestation, we may start with 7 million of these, but by the time, so 20 weeks later, by the time a female is born, we go from having 7 million to only 1 million by birth. And that's because it goes from primordial to primary to secondary, and then what happens is death. A tr what the term we use is atresia. Now what happens is that this follicle just disintegrates and gets reabsorbed back into the ovary. Six million undergo this process, just from 20 weeks gestation to birth. All right, then what? Well, from birth to puberty, we go from having one million of these primordial follicles going through this process to having 300,000. So by the time a female Hits puberty, they've only got 300,000 primordial follicles left because a whole bunch have undergone this process. All of this is without the gonadotropins, without FSH and LH. Now your textbook doesn't say that. Your textbook, which needs to be updated, says that from gestation to birth to puberty, you just have all these primordial follicles that are just sitting there waiting for FSH. Remember FSH stands for follicle stimulating hormone. And the textbooks say that it stimulates the primordial follicle to undergo this process. That's not correct. What's correct is this process is happening. And once puberty hits and FSH gets released, FSH will select one and sometimes more follicles to not undergo atresia. So FSH actually deselects one follicle, generally the biggest follicle that's been made so far, and says, hey, don't undergo atresia, I want you to further develop. And what it means when it further develops is it will go and start to develop more granulosa and theca cells, right? So now we're talking about puberty. This is what's happening, right? We've now got FSH being released. Importantly, something you should know about FSH and LH is that when puberty hits and these hormones are released, it doesn't go down here, pre-puberty, pre-puberty, then puberty hits and it just goes like this and stays up here. The important thing about hormones is they work because they tend to cycle. They have peaks, they have troughs. For the gonadotropins, every 90 minutes they peak and then they trough. 90 minutes, peak, then trough, all right? If that's over 90 minutes, but if you look at it over a 28 day cycle, which tends to be the average female reproductive cycle, you find that the mean or the average of the peaks go up and the mean or average of the peaks go down. And again, it's these not just 90 minute peaks and troughs, but the mean changes over time that signal what should be happening anatomically and physiologically. It's important because when it comes to the contraceptive pill, the female oral contraceptive pill, it smooths out these peaks and troughs, which means it basically stops all these types of things from happening. All right, let's get back. Puberty's hit, FSH has gone up, that has deselected one follicle to say, don't die, you're gonna to start to mature, and this follicle gets bigger. Now what this follicle will do, is as it gets bigger, the granulosa and theca cells, together they produce estrogen, really important. Together, the granulosa and theca cells produce estrogen. Now I'm gonna spell it the way we do here in Australia, with an O at the beginning. But because this follicle is still developing and still getting bigger, 
while it may be producing estrogen, it doesn't produce huge amounts. So it produces relatively low amounts of estrogen. And interestingly, this low amount of estrogen in the bloodstream goes back to where FSH and LH are released. Do you know where they're released from? They're released from the brain. Specifically, you've got the hypothalamus and then the pituitary gland. These hormones are released from the anterior pituitary. All right, anterior pituitary gland. So what happens is that these low levels of estrogen being released here goes back and provides negative feedback. Provides negative feedback to both FSH and LH. It says, stop being released, right? Now you might think, okay, what does that mean then? As this follicle is developing and it's stopping FSH and LH, what does that mean? Well, it means this. What did I say happens when you didn't have FSH? So pre-puberty, follicles just go through this process, then die. That's what we want to happen because we've now already selected the one follicle we want to develop. So dropping FSH means all the follicles that are going to develop after this one are just going to die. Great. That's what we want. Now this follicle is going to just keep getting bigger, right? And it's going to get so big that the granulosa and theca cells are enormous. So there's our granulosa cells. Let's draw up our theca cells. And it turns into what we call ultimately a mature follicle or a graphene follicle or an antral follicle or a pre-ovulatory follicle. What they all tend to have is this little space here called the antrum. And this antrum is filled with fluid and that fluid has hormones and chemicals that again further nourish and look after the follicle. Let's call this a mature follicle. All right, so we've got a mature follicle here. It's so big that what do you think happens now to the estrogen levels? I said the low levels result in negative feedback, but this now produces really high levels of estrogen. So let's bring it down here. So we've got estrogen, but this time the estrogen levels, actually I think a better way of showing that will be to point out that it just brings it higher. So let's make this low, resulting in negative feedback. And this one is going to be high. And what happens is high results, and we don't know why, in positive feedback. So now it goes back to the anterior pituitary gland and results in positive feedback. So you get a spike now in FSH and LH. And this spike specifically in LH, if we go back here, what we, go, what we do is we send this up here and it's resulting in positive feedback specifically of LH. So now we get an LH surge. And this LH surge travels to the ovary and the LH tells this mature follicle to start to break down. And it breaks it down. And when it breaks it down, what's it do? It tells the oocyte inside to ovulate, which means it gets released from the ovary. All right, what has happened? The, over, uh, the oocyte, or the ovum now, has ovulated. And now what we're left with is this bulk of old follicle cells. And again, the oocyte's gone. What we're left with now is something called a corpus luteum. This is now called the corpus luteum. And it's called the corpus luteum. Corpus means body because it's the body that's left from the follicle. Luteum means yellow. It's yellow. Now the question is why is it yellow? We need to think about the why. It's yellow because it's filled with cholesterol. So have a think about this. The granulosa and theca cells they produce estrogen. How do they do this? They produce estrogen because inside of the granulosa and theca cells, there is cholesterol. And cholesterol can be turned into progesterone. And progesterone can be turned into uh, androgens like testosterone. And testosterone is then turned into estrogen. 
Importantly, from cholesterol to progesterone to testosterone, this occurs in the theca cells. But the theca cells don't have the enzymes to turn testosterone into estrogen. So what happens is it then needs to throw it to the granulosa cells, and it's the granulosa cells that turn testosterone into estrogen. What I'm saying is that granulosa and theca cells are filled with cholesterol, which means this corpus luteum is filled with cholesterol. And what this corpus luteum does is it turns that cholesterol straight to progesterone. And so what now happens is that this corpus luteum will produce progesterone. So what have we just produced? So if we take it simply, FSH resulted in these follicle, or this one follicle producing estrogen. FSH goes to estrogen. Let's write this down. It goes FSH, let's say, to follicle, to mature follicle, to estrogen. And then that estrogen stimulated LH and the LH produced not just ovulation, but produced this thing called the corpus luteum. And that corpus luteum produced progesterone. And together, if we have a look at these two, Estrogen and progesterone, their job is to prepare the uterine lining, specifically the functional layer of the endometrium. Together, they make it more vascular, they put in more glands to get it ready for implantation. Think about this now. The corpus luteum is like, and I'm going to steal this from Dr. Najib, who is a legendary physiology lecturer, his analogy was this. <clears throat> the corpus luteum is like a parent that's saying goodbye to their child going off to university. They say, goodbye child, you have a wonderful time at uni, but you need to give me a call when you're there. Now I'm going to give you enough money for 10 days. I'm going to give you enough money for 10 days, but if you don't call me with, within the 10 days, I'm cutting you off. Now the parent is the corpus luteum, the child is the ovum and the money is the progesterone. Let's have a look at the hormones, right? To understand this, let's look at the hormones. Not doing the male yet, we're still doing the female repro here. We're at day zero, we're at day 14, we're at day 28 of the reproductive cycle. The first thing I spoke about was that the first hormones released were FSH and LH. So we've got FSH up here, LH up here. And what happened was, because the FSH allowed for us to deselect one from dying, and that produced estrogen, then what we got was estrogen levels, which started low, started to go up. And I said that as estrogen goes up, right, the low levels of estrogen resulted in negative feedback. So when you get these small amounts of estrogen, you get a reciprocal drop in FSH and LH because of the negative feedback. But then I said, Estrogen levels get so high, and this is generally at around about day 13, estrogen levels get so high that it actually results in positive feedback. And you get a spike in FSH, and you get a spike in LH. And this LH spike, right, because the estrogen's high, resulted in LH spike, that LH spike resulted in ovulation. And when did this ovulation happen? At day 14. Ovulation, generally speaking, at day 14 because of the LH spike. Now, after this, you get this drop, right? Drop in FSH, this drop in LH, and the estrogen levels will drop as well. But what we now get is progesterone being released and going up. So progesterone up until day 14 is pretty low, right? until we've got that corpus luteum after ovulation, and then the, uh, the progesterone, I should say, goes up. And like I said, it will go up for 10 days. So if it's starting at around about day 14-ish, and 10 days will take it to around about here, right? What's gonna happen 
After the 10 days, let's have a think. I said, it's a goodbye child, enjoy university, I'll give you enough money for 10 days, progesterone. You need to call me. What's this call? Well, if that oocyte gets fertilized by sperm and then gets implanted into the uterine lining, it will start to produce a hormone called HCG. And HCG is human chorionic gonadotropin. Gonadotropin. Anterior, posterior, uh, sorry, uh, FSH, LH. They're gonadotropins. That's the phone call that says, hey, mum, dad, I'm here at uni, everything's okay, keep releasing progesterone. So if fertilization happens, right, if a sperm fertilizes and implants and HCG is released, this corpus luteum will keep releasing progesterone. That's pregnancy, right? But if fertilization doesn't happen and there's no HCG being released because there's no implantation, there's no phone call. And after 10 days, if there's no phone call, well, the parents go, I didn't get a phone call, you're cut off. And the progesterone plummets. And then by the time you're at day 28, you've got low levels of estrogen, low levels of progesterone, and the beginning of the next cycle will start with five days-ish of menses or menstruation or bleeding. What this is, is the uterine lining sloughing away because the signal of progesterone and estrogen need to remain high for the uterine lining to remain thick. But if it drops down, the uterine lining sloughs away. So that's the role of FSH and LH in the female reproductive cycle. The question is, what about the male reproductive cycle? It's way simpler. Let's have a look. I told you that for the female, you've got this process happening pre-puberty, where you've got seven million primordial follicles, where one, uh, six million of them will die until birth, and then you've only got one million primordial follicles, and then from there, 700,000 die, when by the time you're at puberty, you've got 300,000 primordial follicles, and that's when FSH and LH kick in. For male reproductive system, not much is happening until puberty hits. And if we take a look at a testy, for example, so a testicle that we term colloquially, let's say testy, you've got the epididymis here, and you've got the testy itself. Inside the testy, you've got all of these tubules called seminiferous tubules, meters of them. If we were to have a look inside of one of these seminiferous tubules, it looks like that with a hollow inside. So that's the hollow inside of the tube and that's just tissue. What you'll find is that you've got around the outside here, sperm stem cells called spermatogonia. Sperm stem cells. They want to turn into sperm, but what they want to do is they want to slowly mature and become sperm or at least spermatids so that by the time they're in the hollow inside, they're spermatids, so immature sperm. And once they're in this hollow aspect of the tube, they'll swim through this tube, the seminiferous tubule, until ultimately they get to the epididymis where they stay and mature until ejaculation. So what tells the spermatogonia to stimulate sperm production? It's FSH and LH. So what happens is you have the FSH will stimulate a certain type of cell called a Sertoli cell. Sometimes it's termed a sustentacular cell. These cells are located within this tissue here, right? LH stimulates another type of cell called a Leydig cell. So remember the L in LH and L in Leydig. This is also known as interstitial cells. And because they're called interstitial cells, they're located outside of the tubing in the interstitia. So the Leydig cells are located out here. Now importantly, Leydig cells will produce testosterone. And Sertoli cells will produce androgen binding protein. A. Now, great thing is, testosterone is an androgen, and this binds to it. So you've got ABP in here, but out here you've got testosterone. 
Now, you don't want to lose this testosterone. Some of it's going to diffuse in, which is great, which means the ABP will bind to it. Now, it keeps it readily available inside this tissue and can present it to the spermatogonia. So once it presents the testosterone to the spermatogonia, right, it's now got all this testosterone, which is a signal for it to undergo that process of turning the stem cell into a spermatid. And that, so let's highlight this, let's bring this together, which means this and this together, stimulate a process called spermatogenesis. And that's sperm production. So as you can see here, the role of FSH and LH, the gonadotropins in the female reproductive system, is a lot more complex than what's happening in the male. However, at the end of the day, it's all to do a similar thing. Prepare the sex cell, which is the ovum or oocyte, and the sperm to be mature and ready for fertilization. That's why they're called the gonadotropins, and I hope that makes sense. Hi everyone, Dr. Mike here. If you enjoyed this video, please hit like and subscribe. We've got hundreds of others just like this. If you want to contact us, please do so on social media. We are on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Dr. Mike Todorovic at D-R-M-I-K-E-T-O-D-O-R-O-V-I-C. Speak to you soon.